Hi. Uh, so, hi, energy. Hi. Uh, so welcome to the 42 Causes podcast. Um, today, I am ridiculously honoured to be speaking to Lady Claire and Sir Connor uh, live from... <laughs> Oh, I can't remember. You travel around the world so much. Spain, Portugal, where are you? America? Portugal. Austin. Portugal. Lisbon. Okay, fantastic. Uh, very jealous. I'm, I'm in the UK again. Just come back from Cape Town. So for those who don't know uh, Connor and Claire, it's, um, well, my wife would describe you as uh, two radiators. Uh, you, you're, you, whenever I sat with Connor or Claire, it's always like uh, speaking with the sunshine. You get a lot of energy. Uh, it's, uh, you're incredible people. And, um, with two very, very different backgrounds, but sort of ended up uh, together, married and now working together, which I'm always massively impressed when people uh, manage to do that. So congratulations. Uh, 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 by the fact that you're smiling, I'm, I'm taking it. It's all still going well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, just uh, rather than me uh, trying to explain what, what, what you do, um, I thought possibly easier if you... Uh, Maybe do it yourself. So yeah, <laughs> Connor or Claire, whichever one wants to start first, like just say like a little bit about yourself uh, so that everyone knows uh, what it is that you do and why you are so amazing. Nice. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> right back at you. Feeling the love. Um, yeah, we run uh, a company together called Forge Well. And what it really is is sort of a training and, and education company. We work with businesses, organizations, helping helping them basically build healthier and more high performance teams. And Claire and I both have our own backgrounds. Uh, I worked for quite a while at Google. She worked at PwC and as well as an entrepreneur. So I think we bring varied experience to this, but we try to approach performance with kind of a health angle as well. And, you know, a lot of the teams that we work with are having some issues with burnout or fatigue and, and they're looking for ways that they can kind of approach work in a more sustainable and healthy fashion. And so we deliver live trainings, online courses, coaching. Um, and yeah, that's, that's us. What did I miss? You nailed it. Succinct. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Did the health part come? Because Claire, you used to, you were running a, um, this amazing food company um, after PwC, if I remember. There was like some really health, was it health bars or something? Was that, but did that link into sort of the health nutrition side of things? It must have given you a different angle, I'd imagine. I think I was always interested in health and nutrition and I started a vegan snack company Um that basically aimed to make peanut butter cups or like chocolate treats that you've seen on the market, um, but with no refined sugars, gluten-free, dairy-free. Um, and yeah, so I think my interest for health definitely had an impact on the type of food I made, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it relates hugely to the course that we've ended up doing that's more personal interest in holistic health i would say right yeah yeah, yeah i would say we're, yeah. we're both very health conscious though so mm -hmm. i think that yeah that definitely factors into it and so we're always trying to optimize sort of our our health as uh, alongside productivity and performance i think is crucial i say the company was just another way where i was trying to be able to have my cake and eat it too, have all, all the sweet things, all the great things in life, but still be healthy. It's just another facet. <laughs> you, you've got Connor in your life. You don't need anything else sweet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, those, they, they were absolutely amazing. So uh, yeah, bravo for making those anyway. But um, I mean, Connor, what was, I guess like Simon Sinek would always ask, you know, what's your why? Like, what was the reason why you, you, you decided to, you know, it's a big move, like, well, I'm a big move for both of you, you know, quitting two incredibly, you know, prestigious jobs and and then deciding like, screw it, let's do it. Um, yeah, what was the kind of was there like one trigger moment or was it a bunch of things? Like uh yeah, what was what was the story? Yeah. Well I as I said, I, I worked at Google for quite a while. I started my career there in New York and you know, when I joined I kind of came in through the back door. I had sort of imposter syndrome. I had like a very non-traditional route uh, into the hiring process. 
So when I got there, I was like surrounded by these brilliant people with very fancy degrees. I felt a bit of like an imposter. And I think in that light, I was, I was like, wow, I gotta, I gotta get really productive and really like effective and efficient if I'm going to succeed here. Uh, and I loved what Google was doing. There's so many cool projects. And so I was like, if I'm going to be able to get placed onto these, I've got to get great at working. And so I applied myself uh, with a lot of diligence to that sort of pursuit of productivity um, and worked out well. I got promoted. got a cool job uh, out in San Francisco on this team called Google for Entrepreneurs. And uh, yeah, I was working with a global team. We were opening up these startup hubs all over the world. And eventually I, I got to move to the London campus. And it was when I got to London, not too long after, but I, I kind of fell into a team dynamic that was a little dysfunctional and not much was happening. And I really wanted to kind of change our course. And so I just started pushing really hard. I was like leaning heavily on all the stuff I learned in, in the world of productivity. And I was working really late. I was working on weekends. And I slowly realized like my attitude became very cynical. I was always complaining after work to anyone who would listen about what was happening. And I just started to sense I was like, I was kind of neglecting friendships, neglecting my health, which as, as we mentioned was so important to me. And I just started to feel those, those sort of signs of burnout and, and fatigue. And I realized I needed a new approach, like kind of grinding myself down wasn't, wasn't going to do it. And so that was the first sort of aha moment when I had to take a step back and think a little bit differently about how I was working, you know, what types of, uh, uh, what types of approaches I was bringing to my day to day. And I just came into contact with some amazing people, Jake and John from the Make Time book. We've included them in the course. That was really a framework. I continue to teach it today. That changed my life. I got real deep into meditation, emotional intelligence, really kind of that in inward journey. Uh, so the Search Inside Yourself program that's very famous at Google, I, I took and then I started teaching. Elements of that, I think, are woven in the course. And yeah, I started to change and I started to really see the benefits. And then very kind of informally, people were asking me, like, what are you doing differently? Because you don't seem so stressed anymore. You know, I, I got a really great promotion very quickly and was managing Europe, Middle East and Africa. That's where you and I first met. I was I was in, in Amsterdam yeah. for a, a conference and and I started to realize, wow, I'm doing these small things and making a huge difference and um, people want to know. And I started sharing and I realized as I shared, I, I learned even more and it deepened my experience. It felt good. And that kind of catapulted me to, uh, yeah, the company where I am today. And that, you know, it took me a couple of years before I, I made the jump. Um, but yeah, super happy I did. I mean, Claire, did you see this transition or when you, when you met Connor, was he already a Zen master? <laughs> <laughs> he was, you were quite a Zen master, I would say. I definitely, I would say for me, I am not, productivity is not necessarily my passion. Um, and it's something yeah. I'm probably resistant to because I'm good at getting a lot of stuff done quickly. But Connor kind of slowly ninjaed them into my life um, with experiments and, and different things, which I, I love doing. And I think I've seen such an incredible impact with all of the tools and techniques that we've used. My passion's probably more along the stress management um, and behavioral psychology elements of it. And yeah, but the tools... The tools really are amazing. They're so simple, but they work so well. And I went from really changing mindsets from always just trying to do as much as I could, working my job, working my other company after I got home from work to really thinking about what I wanted, thinking about what would make me happy and sort of changing the way I worked. Um, and that's been pretty amazing. I, I mean, I guess a lot of people must have that. Um, probably people listening, they'd, you know, particularly if you work in these sort of you know, if you work in, well, if you work in advertising, marketing, or anything to do with the tech world or consulting with PwC or anything like that, they are very stressful jobs. Um, and, you know, the, the workloads that companies give you 
kind of, especially if it's a big company, is kind of endless. Um, yeah. So I guess there's a lot of it like trying to set your barriers or like try and, you know, how do you push back against a company that's that's giving you a lot of stuff? Do you, do you have to just, is it as simple as raising your hand and saying, hey, I'm, I'm too busy, go away? <laughs> what, what are the tricks? <laughs> I would say it was a little bit different for me. I had a lot of boundaries set in place already because I needed to leave my job and be efficient in my job at a decent time so I could go and work on my chocolate company in the evening and the weekends. So I had those boundaries in place already, but I would say for most people that I saw struggling, they don't know how to say no. They don't know um, how to prioritize or to focus on a, on a particular task. Um, and e even myself, like I definitely would struggle with it. I don't know what there, I don't think there's any secret element or secret source to kind of figuring out what works. You just have to try all of these different tools and tactics and figure out what works for you. Yeah. I mean, we, it's like the question we face all the time. Um, and why we get, why we get hired. It's, it's, it is difficult. I think we partially it's this culture so we live in an age in which there just seems to be just an endless amount of things to get done and so um that kind of infects like working teams and organizations and and we have technology which makes it feel like we can just do a million things at once but we're dealing with quite uh quite ancient uh hardware in a sense so partially it's like recognizing a little bit that humans are are somewhat limited in this capacity and actually although it doesn't it seems counterintuitive that slowing down and focusing on one thing at a time is going to get you further than trying to do it all at once um it's really true and there's a lot of research to support this and i think um so yeah we we, we do come into companies and just say like it's kind of this false dichotomy because they say, well, we can't, we, if, if we, we can't reduce the workload because nothing will get done. And I say, well, if you don't reduce this workload, nothing is going to get done because people are so overwhelmed and busy that they can't actually make meaningful progress. And so they're going in a million different directions all at once. I love like the diagram um, from essentialism, um, which kind of shows it's just kind of like, a little arrow and then it's kind of in a hundred different directions but the arrow only goes a very short distance because like when you have a hundred things you're going to do you're just getting like an inch in each direction but if you can just pick and choose a couple of things you can extend that and you can actually go and make real progress on a few things so i think that's that's really important the second thing is we we really now see that like the problems companies are having with retention and um, employee engagement. So like there's a real cost that companies are paying for not dealing with this like overwhelming workload. And the cost is that people will leave. And like this has sped up a lot since the pandemic. Um, it's always changing. It's sometimes the employer's market. Sometimes it's the employee's market. But especially for like the world class companies and and we're lucky to work with some of them, companies like Google, companies like L'Oreal, you know, they're competing for top talent and for them to lose top talent because of the internal conditions is like super painful and expensive. So I think now people are really open to hearing from us to say, what do we need to do to slow things down, to help people feel like they're more effective? And ultimately like that ties back to their their bottom line. Um, but sometimes like the biggest enemy is ourselves because sometimes we're just the ones internally creating a million things for us to do. And we're, we're, all, we're all, oh, I, I have too many things, my boss, my this, my that. But a lot of the times it, it is, it does start with sort of an internal sense of like, take a breath, like, okay, what's actually on my plate? What's really important? What's meaningful to me? And just making those decisions like day by day, moment by moment really help a lot. Yeah, I am. Um, it was interesting. You said sort of, you know, this isn't this isn't a new thing. It's kind of been around for a long time, and and part of the reason is probably because of historical stuff. I mean, and I know, and 
I don't think I even mentioned. So we, the reason why we're having this conversation is we made an incredible course together. It's called Sustainable Productivity. <laughs> Plug the course. <laughs> should have, probably should have started with that. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's on 42 courses. It's, uh, it's actually uh, one of our highest ranked course ranked courses we've, we've ever made. Uh, so we had the most uh, incredible feedback from people who have gone through the course. So do check it out. But um, yeah, one of the things we were talking about was this historical kind of evolution of the workplace. Um, I just wondered if, if it, I know we mentioned it a bit in the course. I remember just being fascinated when you were talking about it. Like, is there any way you can just summarize some of that stuff uh, for us? <laughs> he can, he can. He's well, he's well versed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of ways to kind of splice like the historical evolution of work. I mean, kind of to make it really simple, I would say pre-industrial revolution, so pre sort of like 18th century, like most most people were working in sort of an agrarian economy, and which meant we were just mainly like farming and doing things related to that, and like small jobs. And so like the the way in which people approach work was quite simple and productivity was usually the result of just like having more land, having more laborers, et cetera. And with the industrial revolution, which sort of spawned through some amazing inventions like the steam engine, like the cotton gin, the telegraph, the railroad. I think we all have ideas of what that looks like, you know, kickstarted in, in, in Great Britain, uh, but really kind of spread over the world quite quickly. Like people, people's working lives changed a lot because people left kind of rural countrysides, moved into what became cities to work in factories. And, you know, this kind of happened very quickly in like the span of human evolution because we were farming for like 10,000 years. And then all of a sudden within like 100 years, a lot of people in, in, in more industrial, in, in, in the Western world at least moved into factory work. So what happened is like people got very interested in like, how do we make these factories more efficient because people are trying to increase profit. And so this is where a lot of kind of interesting things come. So you can think of like Henry Ford uh, and sort of like the Model T as a, as a good example of this, of like figuring out how to restructure an assembly line was like a really important innovation in that time. It's like that same time when you get the word like a line manager because right, you have people that are managing the line, the assembly line. And so it, it very much becomes like how many widgets can you produce per hour? And so like the, the countries and the companies that do very well are those in which those factories get very, very efficient, very, very fast. The problem is like a lot of those ideas we've inherited into this new age of work. And so like the information that's kind of like the, I would say the third phase that we're sort of in the sort of information economy kind of kicks off in the sixties or seventies really gains pace in the nineties as like the personal computer becomes very widespread. And then in the last 30 years with the internet, it's becoming the kind of status quo for people to work in this knowledge work. And it gets really challenging because we, in knowledge work, it's very different because the, what the outputs we make, they're not so measurable. And like one brilliant idea can be worth so, so, so much value but it might come in a very non-linear way. Like that might come when you're out on a walk in a park, you know, and, or you're in the shower or you're, you're, at a, you're going on a run at the gym. But like, we're still confined to this idea that we need to sort of work these sort of 40 hour work weeks, which is again, an advent of the industrial revolution. And we're struggling a lot with trying to figure out how do you, how do you measure a person's productivity and, for most of us, we just think more, more, more. And so it gets us in this idea. I'm just going to send more emails. I'm going to check more things off my to-do list. And we get in, it's just like efficiency. And like, that's what the factory was all about, efficiency. But with the, the modern world of work, it's much more about effectiveness. It's not like how many emails did you send today? It's like, what did you get done that made a difference to our key goals and objectives? And it might only be one or two actions you took that can move the needle, 
but it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that. And it's hard for us to, to come to grips with what that really looks like. And so I think this is an exciting time because we're figuring out how to motivate, how to incentivize knowledge work, how to measure it, um, and how to do it in a way which doesn't lead to so much burnout. And I guess it's super tough if you've got, yeah, you because know, the world's so connected now, a lot of us are working with people in different time zones all over the place. And I wonder also whether this is kind of, you know, what, what we put the value on as though m most people I know sort of they're, they're, they're almost judged by their hourly rate. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that that seems possibly wrong. Uh, I remember seeing like there's a there's a clip that goes around about I think it was someone who's showing an example of making a logo for someone, and uh, and they're like, you know, cool. So uh, you know, you you want this done really fast, and they're like, yeah, 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 really fast, and they're like, cool, like all right, I've done it in uh, you know one hour. That's going to be uh, twenty thousand dollars, and they're like, wow, it's way too much. And they're like, okay, cool. Like, what if I took like three weeks and I charge you twenty thousand dollars, and they're like. Oh, yeah, I get what you mean. Like, I want it faster, but like, then I don't want to pay so much. So it's like this weird, I think the way that we value wages and, and value kind of your hourly rate rate is, is also probably maybe a weird, weird way to go down. I don't know what the, I mean, I haven't chatted to you about this before, but I, I wonder philosophically whether no. there's another way, like, is it output based or something? But then I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Sorry, this is a random conversation. <laughs> no, I think it's really interesting. And I think when you were talking about it, it gives me a parallel to how employers value employees at work. A lot of time mm. you're valued by the amount of face time you put in or who the right people you know of, whether obviously you're valued on outputs as well, but it's not it's not so direct. And I wonder if there is a better way of valuing people just because some people are more efficient or effective and get more things done, do they have a higher value than those who drag that same task out over a longer period of time? They should, but then they're also seen as idle in some respects as well. So it's an interesting. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen this, but there's like, because of, because of this whole thing with like measuring, measuring time, there's a whole like thing of, of like devices you can use to like tap your keyboard every five seconds so that you can stay active on your team slack or on your microsoft teams and like <laughs> like there's these new sort of devices and technologies because people are so afraid that if they if they step away if they walk away and some employers are are measuring that and yeah i think yeah. it's um mm -hmm. it's difficult it's difficult because we're we're trying to measure like what matters now is like problem solving creativity innovation sort of like navigating through like ambiguity and you know there are of course there are still roles there are still salespeople or customer support that are measured by how much they sell or how many tickets they resolve but for a lot of people you know to quantify the value of solving a problem it can be very difficult and so yeah i think we do defaults and there's just a legacy historic like mm -hmm. there's a legacy culture that exists, which is sort of just this like kind of mad men era, just like, or how late are you in the office? And then like, mm -hmm. you know, are you going out to drinks and, you know, with, with your colleagues and just kind of all, like all of this sort of just, are you there? And mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a value in spending time with your colleagues and being there and going out and having drinks, of course. But I think most people feel really, like chained a bit to to work and they don't have the autonomy and i think you know daniel pink talks a lot about that that like autonomy mastery and purpose are really important for people to have that motivation to succeed and i think autonomy is um is yeah really really important in this but yeah measuring people's time and quantifying it is very hard and it incentivizes the wrong behaviors at the end of the day yeah yeah yes. i agree yeah I mean, one of the things that it, it made me think of, um, <laughs> you were saying there's a program that automatically taps the keyboard to show that you're still you know, at work and active. It reminded <laughs> me of like, this, sort of maybe that's another use for chat GPT. You can sort of plug an API into like talk to Slack, <laughs> sort of create fake conversations with your work colleagues. <laughs> I mean, the, um, 
with things like chat gpt coming along i mean particularly people working in the in the creative space i mean i i get a feeling it's it's about to revolutionize a lot of things um mm. in that like if we're looking at the stuff that we're looking at right now isn't perfect but i mean if this is kind of a version one and it's it's already been used in so many incredible ways you know what's version three four and five going to look like it's going to be quite scary but what what do you how do you think these kind of these kind of things might impact you know things like sort of stress and 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 productivity in the workplace and sort of the 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 stuff that you talk about the the sustainable productivity things do you think it is going to be something that that helps or that that maybe makes things more difficult um Hmm. i think it can go both ways Mm -hmm. i mean one like it's certainly gonna accelerate the the change in the workplace and i think we'll continue like we're already seeing a lot of sort of like menial labor being automated. And I think I think that's going to be a very easy thing for AI. So like a lot of jobs that don't have intellectual, um, that they don't have a human intellectual element will be very easily automated. So that creates, on one side, it's a positive because it means that hopefully more people can work in jobs that are more, interesting and more fun and more challenging and it's not just like typing typing numbers into a spreadsheet Mm -hmm. um but then this also creates another another challenge because i think many people aren't necessarily prepared for that autonomy and that responsibility and i think that's where the tools we teach in sustainable productivity are are really important because you know when you do have a really simple kind of, all right, just, you know, chug through this or do these three things. It's kind of mindless. Like you don't really need the the sort of focus and the energy that we're talking about in the course, but it's more when you enter into that place where it's like this, you know, all the busy work is gone. So like now we're just left doing the hard stuff. Well, like that's where these tools really matter. Um, and I think there's, I think they're going to be super helpful for us in terms of um, supporting our creativity, helping us um, connect new ideas, you know, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of really cool stuff happen from from groups I follow on Twitter, and that you know, journaling with ChatGPT. And I do think I don't know if, if ChatGPT, but I think AI in general will help with the the wellness and the stress stuff because um, we're getting closer and closer to having understandings of biomarkers and behaviors that might point us to earlier stages of, of, you know, the exhaustion and fatigue before you get to stress. So if we have tools like that, and if that is more broadly available, then we might be able to educate people and people can have, you know, in the same way that you might have the Apple watch tells you every 30 minutes, you should stand up and like move your body a little bit. You know, we might see that there's, you know, AI that's able to tell you based on your work output, hey, like, you know, you've been sat here for three hours, you did two, two and a half hours of meetings, and now you're answering emails, like, we can tell that your, you know, your speed of, of comprehension or cognition is going down, like, we're going to force you to take a walk. And you're like, oh, you know, that that would be the the, the hope is that these things like support us in being more human. That would be genius. Imagine if you you uh you had uh, a sort of your your own ai assistant that looked after your calendar and it just pushes back automatically to your boss and says look claire and connor are really busy right now <laughs> in three weeks time <laughs> um yeah i think it's amazing. a good, nice Basically idea that yeah conversation um I'm, yeah there's and I'm some sure cool that like, something like that will happen <laughs> yeah there are some like i see reclaim.ai is like a kind of ai enhanced calendar that that does, you kind of give it your inputs, how much focus time you want. And then it will kind of nudge you and tell you, look, you have too many meetings. And then you kind of rate yourself. So it learns about you better. I think that's amazing. Cause I've spent like 10 years taking little notes and reflections and trying to figure out like, when's the best time to do this work for me? Like, how do I feel on this day? Is this a good day for that meeting? How many meetings is too much? 
and it's very, you know, kind of ad hoc. And it'd be great to have tools like that that can help you and just be like, uh, you said you've said ten times now that if you do more than four meetings in a row, you really feel like shit. And so <laughs> we're not going to let you do this meeting. And you're like, oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks AI, thanks AI. Yeah. I want it to write the letter to my boss though, telling me. That yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. There's honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The um the other Who's your you, boss, you, Chris? Who's your boss? Um <laughs> <laughs> just a ping. What's up, Jake, for you? I, yeah, I mean Jake. <laughs> all the people I work with. <laughs> um but um the the there was one thing I think it was Claire you you mentioned earlier when you were chatting, you were saying that it's often hard hard to stay focused and i know one of the things i think you mentioned in the course which i loved is, is like is it, i think you call it a one minute reset is that right mm-hmm. what's the what was <laughs> tell me how that one goes <laughs> well tell i know how it goes tell the people how that one goes <laughs> <laughs> so i think with the one minute reset essentially uh I've actually totally forgot this one. I forgot it. But <laughs> okay. I, I think I think where it is is the one minute reset. Should we take a one minute reset right now? Yeah, we'll take a one minute reset. Yeah, yeah. But whenever you're Connor, feeling you're on over- stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever you're feeling overwhelmed or you're doing too much or you feel like you're just in your emails, taking a one minute reset to kind of step back, take a scan, see what you're doing, see if you're actually focused on what you want to do before you take a deep breath and actually go back into it can be really helpful. Mm. And like, there's a huge piece where, you know, our bodies and our minds are so connected and using that one minute reset to do some deep breathing um, can really slow down the body function, slow down the mind function and actually put you in a much more focused zone to be able to move forward. That would be my, remembrance of the one minute reset but feel yeah, free spot to... on. yeah that's yeah, fun it's just a, now it. just a nice thing to do when you're like you know you just find yourself deep into something that's not very important and yeah. you're or feeling feeling that overwhelm i always i like to just shut the laptop and just like even close as many tabs and and just do like a little cleaning of the of the desk but like uh in a in a virtual way cleaning up the screen yeah. It's really nice. And yeah, we don't talk about this in the course, but there's 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 a, another cool tool you can kind of pair with that, which is to basically look off into the horizon. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, basically when you're focusing, like there's a real optical part that's related to the eyes. So like when you focus, you're looking at something that's very close. Um, and so that that triggers all these like neurochemical reactions in your body to to kind of pay more attention it like releases some cortisol and some epinephrine and adrenaline to like help you. But like, you can't stay closely focused on something forever. Um, most of us probably can't do it for like two minutes, but generally, you know, with practice, you can do it for an hour, hour and a half. And then if you look at something like far off in the horizon, it basically gives you like an optical reset and it allows your eyes basically defocus. And as a result, your eyes are like attached to your brain um, in a literal sense. So you you feel a sense of like like decompression and that can kind of give you just a little bit of a pause to decide what's the next most important thing, because I think that's we kind of freak out about productivity and prioritization. And we we think we have to have these perfect plans and like have to have everything dialed in, but like really when it comes down to it, your day is just like lived in these like five minute increments where you're like a little bit focused and then you keep doing it, you keep doing it, but then you just can kind of go way off course. And all you really need is like that one minute reset is so nice. And you can do some tools like that to just be like, all right, the last hour on TikTok wasn't worth it, but like, what's the next five or 10 minutes going to look like? And like that can, all you need is like five minutes to change your day in a huge way to Mm -hmm. start back in on something important. We did it today. I was honestly having such a shit day. Like I'm like two days, three days off of caffeine and feeling like doing a little bit of an elimination diet. And I'm just like, Oh, 
And I, I went out to Claire and I was like, I just, I'm doing nothing. And she helped me like put stuff on paper. And we're like, all right, what's one thing? I made a little cup of tea. And then you just kind of, all right, let's get back to it. So I think these things, we're, we do them every day and we're, we're not perfect at all. Um, it's, there's no like, no perfection in the system. It, I think that's the thing that become integrated and in, sorry, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, it's amazing how these small, it's these small things that can have such a profound impact. And that's a sort of a, you know, whenever we chat, I always pick that up. It's like, it's not, you know, often when you, when you get into these problems, you, you know, sometimes it can feel like overwhelming and, and I'm just like, wow, like, where do I even begin to start to try and fix this? And it's whenever I chat with, with you both, it's, it's always really lovely to see that there are actually a lot of these things are very simple things that you can do that have a profound impact. So yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I think we're just, we're just simpleton. So we're just simpleton. honestly, any, anything, comp anything complex, I've never been able to keep. And so this, maybe other people can do that, but I just, I'm like a super basic person. So I think it's that But works. I think they, they are just things that end up getting integrated into your life and like, right whether you call it a one minute reset, you call it a deep breath, you call it looking out into the distance, which also has benefits of leaving you a lot more refreshed at the end of the day. They're all little things that become part of your life that you don't even realize you're doing anymore, but have such a large impact on your overall well-being. Yeah. And I think just the way that you, the way that you put things together in, in this course, and I'm sure in the workshops that you do is so lovely. Cause I mean, when you, you know, if you look up sort of productivity online, it's just sort of full of these like super hectic apps <laughs> that sort of mostly scare the bejesus out of me. Uh, and it's just so nice sort of listening to people who just say things in plain English and don't make it seem so overwhelmed. I mean, is that is that something that you that you come up against when you're doing sort of client work? It's like, oh, yeah, like we tried this. I don't know, really expensive, some overly complicated thing. And it just sort of actually hasn't helped us. Like, um, <laughs> they're like, <laughs> when we worked with McKinsey last year. We had this really expensive project, but nothing's happened. No, no dings on McKinsey, but yeah, I think yeah. that, that typically that, that, that does happen. I Mass think Connor yeah. has also a unique skill set where he is able to distill all of this information that he has in his head into a very, mm. very simple way that people can understand. Um, I'm always really impressed by it. I think when clients see him lead a workshop, he gives them digestible content that they can understand, but it's also really practical and you can put into place right mm -hmm. away. And I think mm -hmm. that's always something that sticks out to clients amongst above mm -hmm. anything else, really. Yeah. yeah I think my, I, I, my, my, I was going to say when my, when my wife took your course, I mean, her, one of her big takeaways was that kind of finding her golden hour. She just said that yeah. that made such a, a big, big difference in her life. It's such a simple idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a simple, it's a simple one. And and they make sense. They're, they're almost like. They're kind of, yeah, we always say that's like, they're like, most of them are common sense, just not common practice. So when we come into companies, it's like, I don't, there's not, if you've been, if you've been, if you've, if you've studied self-development, if you've, if you've looked at this at all, like what we're going to tell you is. You know, you might learn, we might, we might have a couple of tricks up our sleeves, like the horizon stare and these things that, but like mostly it's like slowing down, choosing a few things each day to focus on, mm -hmm. like blocking out your distractions, taking breaks, getting away from the screen, energizing. And um, yeah, I think, you know, we do come up it, like we come up against it with clients because they, you know, they do want new things. Um but I think what we try to share with them is like, it's like this whole process is just about like forgetting and remembering, forgetting and remembering. And we're just there to like kind of remind and help people remember like what's important to you. And mm -hmm. a lot of people know that, like a lot of people know what like their values or their principles, like they know things, but they're like, they get, they get distracted from it. Right. And like, what are the things that energize you? A lot of people like intuitively they know those things, but they're just like, oh, right. Like I needed that reminder to go on the afternoon walk or to call a friend when I'm feeling a bit down. Mm -hmm. And then also just the reminder is that like you're, you're in control. Um, and that, that's probably what we've heard a lot recently is, is um, when we come in and we're, we're kind of advocating for a more 
proactive approach to your your work day like being being proactive with putting breaks onto your calendar being proactive with scheduling that golden hour and telling your colleagues like there's no way I'm doing a meeting in this hour like this is this is the hour I'm going to do something really important and a lot of a lot of times people come back to us they're like oh right like I do I am able to say that I'm taking this hour. I am able to move this meeting. And so I think sometimes we just, you know, we just get stuck because we kind of fall back into a pattern and we feel like life is happening to us rather than for us in a sense. And so we, I don't know, I think a lot of what we're doing is just reminding people of these things um, Mm -hmm. and, and showing them these things work, you know, it just takes practice and you don't have to be perfect. You just have to keep starting again, starting again. I love that. Well, just uh, um, just to summarize, in case people don't know what it is, the the golden hour. Well, I mean, the golden hour is basically like your your sort of best best hour of energy. So, like you know, depending on who you are, like some of us are going to feel great right after we wake up. Some of us are going to feel great in like the kind of seven to eight o'clock window. Like it really depends. Um, the majority of us, I, I, it turns out are, are more inclined towards the morning. And so basically figuring out like, when's your highest energy and then figuring out like, what's the most important, what's like the biggest thing you want to do? What's the most like fulfilling task or project you want to spend on and do it in that time. Um, so it's just like that principle, like time is very relative. So it's like an hour for me from like four to five o'clock, it's not equal to an hour from 10 to 11. So I'm going to be much more careful in the morning, 10 to 11, that I'm being, you know, spending that time well and when wisely, because I know that it's very relative. So um, I think that's how it, how I explain it. Yeah. I mean, do, do you have, out of interest, do you both have different, different golden hours or, or are they kind of the same? We're both pretty big morning people yeah um i would say our best hours are probably nine till 12 right maybe maybe earlier than nine but yeah those morning hours are very important for us so we try and schedule Mm -hmm. meetings or any kind of internal catch-ups we do that later in the day and try and get creative work writing time everything in the morning i know you're a night owl (laughs) (laughs) I, i find i find i can think very clearly in the in the morning um and then uh, mm. and then I can but I can do stuff maybe a little bit easier later on and I, I think for me it's it's often I, I I think it's probably the same whether you're a morning person or an evening person um I know that's a gross simplification but I'd imagine the commonality between the two is that often it's about finding these times when you know you're not going to be getting loads of emails and like having notifications pinging up at you e- even if you can't see them you kind of know that there are certain times of the day when things are just quieter um because mm-hmm. i think mm-hmm. often when you find these i don't know whether you get the same thing often when i'm you know if i take like a, an hour in the morning or maybe like from nine to ten or something and i'm just doing thinking part of me is also a little bit anxious that oh my god there's like during that time i know there's going to be loads of things coming in even if i can't see them even if i turn off the notifications and then when i see them i'm like ah oh, why did i do that <laughs> like now i've got to catch up on all this stuff like how do you <laughs> how do you yeah but, how do you cope but with then that? you've just you've, you've you've just done your like i i think it, it is a it is a it is a tension and like mm-hmm. you've everyone's job is very different, right? So like you're running a company, you have employees. So, you know, you take all the advice we have with a grain of salt and you have to apply it to, to sort of your own life. I mean, my, my general feeling is like, if I've used that hour, the highlight time, the golden hour in a good way, I feel so accomplished and fulfilled that even if I come out of that and I've got a bunch of emails, um, it doesn't bother me because like I have right. I have the rest of the day to kind of go after those things. I I think I also set up a, a an expectation with my like our the people we work with, our clients, our team, that we're a bit slower to respond. Like we're not typically like we're going to reply right away because mm-hmm. we think 
we, we, we prioritize like thoughtfulness and space to reflect and like a slower sort of more purposeful approach. And like that comes at a cost of sort of responsiveness. And so I also don't worry so much if clients of ours, you know, I, I say to my email signature, I'm like, it takes me two days to kind of get back. And, and, and this is, this is, how, this is kind of how we operate. And to be honest, most of them tend to love it because they're like, this is great. And I've seen them, I've had, I've had a lot of people, I stole that from someone on, on Twitter and I've had a lot of people copy that from me as well, to our clients. So, but to answer your specific question, because we know you also do a role where you have to respond to customers, which creates a very different need. If you can think just as well as you can in the evening and that works for you and you have the space to do it, that's your time. You, you take that evening time to work. If you can do it in the morning, you really like focusing in the morning, do it two to three times a week and have the other times. The best part of this is like, you can really design it to whatever fits best for you. Mm. So I think like Connor said, you just take everything that we've suggested with a pinch of salt and just experiment to figure out. And that's Mm. one of the biggest parts of, of what we teach as well. Just keep on experimenting, keep on iterating, figure out what works for you different times of your life, different parts are going to work better for you. Um, so just take it as a constant experiment. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, yeah. I love your, um, the other thing I use all the time after taking your course is, uh, is time blocking. It's just such a small thing, but so powerful. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, and also I think it's something that most people can do quite easily, particularly like when you, most people have shared, shared schedulers now, nowadays in most companies everything kind of in the cloud and shared all the time so you just like say you know put in don't don't put in like necessarily thinking time like just make the title something serious <laughs> and then yeah, 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 yeah. Question why that hour is blocked out in your in your diary but um <laughs> i used to do that at pwc i'd just be like <laughs> important yeah. meeting proposal for the ceo oh, yeah yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Just yeah so i think you can so, get work but... done yeah yeah <laughs> yeah Oh, brilliant. <laughs> but um, yeah, look, thank you so much. I know we've, we've, uh, I've taken up a lot of your time. So I really appreciate you both taking the time to, uh, to say hi. It's always an absolute honor. And um, yeah, I mean, for, uh, for anyone who's, who's doesn't know of uh, Claire and Connor's work, uh, yeah, go check out the sustainable productivity course um, or uh, visit Forgewell. Is it forgewell.com? Or for- Dot co. Dot co. Dot we're co. very cutting edge. Yeah. Dot co. You don't even, you don't even yeah. the M. We're so effective. Uh, we're dropping the M. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. awesome. And yeah, Forgewell is F O R G E W E L L. Forgewell. Yes. Co. Um, and uh, or you can look them up on on Twitter and all the other normal social media things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there any uh, any 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 parting uh, words of wisdom uh, from from yourselves, Claire and Connor? Um, Anything, uh, any sort of top tip you, you've learned that you want to lead, lead with people or, uh, any, uh, uh favorite quote, anything <laughs> could be anything, no pressure. You go. I mean, yeah, I, I, I got a million things to say, obviously <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. The, I mean, um, I'll also plug our, our, our newsletter, 1% wisdom, because this oh, is, yes. this is like the same the same idea I come back to all the time. So you can, you can find that on Forgewell. It's on Substack. You'll, you can just Google that. But um, so yeah, I think when we're approaching, thank you. Thank you. I think when approaching like any of any big goals or like we're trying to get more productive or get better with our well being and our wellness, it's very tempting to want to just go all in and do everything all at once. But it's really hard to sustain that and most people fail and then most people give up and kind of the name 1% of wisdom, how we came from it is, is one part is we, I'm super inspired by James clear. So he talks a lot about this in atomic habits, which is like, if you just dedicate yourself to 1% better every day, it's exponential growth over time, 37 X in a year. And that these like small actions create these huge compound results over time. And I've seen that in so many facets in my, in my work life, in my fitness, in my personal life. And the other 
twist to the 1% name is uh, Patabi Joyce, who's uh, a very famous yogi, often said that yoga is 1% theory and 99% practice. And I think that's the same for these ideas and self-development as a whole is like theory theory is fine and great and ideas and it's, it's all very helpful. Our course is packed with them, but ultimately it's about taking action and just like practicing these things. And so I just, that's my, my motivational way to end for people is just to try to think like, what's one thing you can do that'll like bring you closer to the direction of your goals, like make it small, make it repeatable. And yeah, if you miss, if you screw up, like, don't worry, just start again. And something Amazing. I'll just add to that is I think people just should give themselves a break. Um, you know, we live in a system that we talk about in the course, it's broken. We live in a system where it's structured for us to do more and more and more and for us to be on that treadmill. Um, so yeah, just give yourself a break. Do like Connor said, 1% changes, small changes every day, and they will have an impact over a long period of time that you won't even realize you're making. Perfect. Perfect. So if you're listening to this, take a break, <laughs> stop what you're doing, stop <laughs> look into the horizon um, and from ripples, uh, waves will appear and uh, your life will change for the better. Um, yeah, thank you so, that's a nice so one. Much, uh, Thanks, Chris. You. And um, thank you, yeah, Chris. I look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. Um, if you're ever in the UK, let me know. And, and, and I'd love a good excuse to go to Portugal. I miss the sunshine. Um, so You're hopefully, welcome anytime. Hopefully, thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much again. Cheers. Cheers.